There's many youth workers, many community workers, people that work in statutory services, and just parents in the community that would like to have an insight about what's taking place within the inner city. So I thank you all today for attending this particular session. For those that are viewing on YouTube and whatnot, please um, send your comments um, and ask questions in relation to the topic, and I'll try and help you um, with those particular answers. I first thought it would be best to kind of start off with a, a proverb. And it's an African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. Why am I saying that? Many of us have had discussions this morning and we've spoke about a range of different issues pertaining to young people within our communities. And we've all acknowledged that our communities are disorganised. There's lack of unity, lack of trust. Someone had mentioned that whole crabs in a barrel scenario. But I thought I'd put that proverb out there to kind of make people think about where we need to go and where we need to attain in order if we're going to reach and try and change the reality of our young people in our community. So it takes a village to raise a child. I think it's, I think it's fair that before I do any presentation or I talk about a particular issue, to say what my objective is and a reason and a rationale why I'm doing this here today. So my objective is simple. I hate seeing young men in prison. I hate seeing mothers and fathers crying because they don't know what to do with their children. I hate going to hospitals to visit young people that are gun and knife crime victims. I hate going to funerals. So my purpose today is simply just to give you all some advice. And for also young people in the room that are here today, for me to give you that advice so you, so you don't visit those prison walls, those prison gates. My advice, hopefully, will make you think differently so you don't end up in a mental health institution or end up at the grave. So that's my objective. I think it's important and it's imperative, again, that we all make our objectives clear about why we're here. So let's go into it. It's not my problem. Every time I'm out there in the community, any time that I deliver a workshop, parents, practitioners, or just people just generally that live within our communities, I'm always hit with this problem. It's not my problem. That's why I'm always here. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is look at a range of different things and then let's see if this in true is not our problem. So let's start with an image. I thought you may not know what this image is, but I just want you to look at it a little bit closely. So this image is an image of a 9mm bullet that was taken out of the back of one of the young people that I work with. This young individual, I won't say his name. This individual wasn't an individual that is involved in gangs. Wasn't an individual that was involved in any form of criminal activity. But was a young person like most young people in the inner city community standing up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And an individual that was in beef with another individual from another postcode aimed a firearm at a group of young people, shot it, and it hit my young person in the back. So when I visit hospitals and I speak to these young people when their parents are upset, don't know what to do, and these young people are shocked with the reality that's just hit them. When you speak to those young people, when I interview these young people, they always say, you know what? I didn't want this to happen. I was standing up in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I asked that question, is it our problem? Because we all can sit here today and we can all argue that, you know what, violence within our community as a whole, I'm not going to label it as gang violence, I'm going to say youth violence. Youth violence is an issue within our community and most people have that perspective by saying that it's not my problem until it comes onto your doorstep. And many young people that have visited hospitals for gun or knife crime incidents that have impacted young people within our community, when I speak to their parents and I speak to their mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, and I ask that question, did you believe that this would happen or this affliction would happen to your child? They'll all say, you know what, I didn't. But now it's here, I want to know what I can do to safeguard my child, my children, or my family members so they don't become involved in this type of behaviour or become victims of this type of behaviour. 
So I ask that question again. Is youth violence within our city, within Birmingham, the West Midlands, is it our problem? Some people in this room right now may still hold that it's not your problem because you may have children that are socially included, not involved in any type of criminal activity or any antisocial behaviour, and you may still believe that it's not your problem. So let me show you another image. And let me put it into a context. Before I show you another image, let me put it into context. Since 2012, over 18 youth provisions have been closed across the city. 18 plus youth provisions have been closed since 2012. Since 2012, there's been over 168 of our young men that have been sent to prison. Continued ignorance within our community, and it's time to wake up to the reality of our young people. There's been over 200 admissions to hospitals due to knife and gun injuries. There's been six fatalities and six funerals. Six fatalities and six funerals. In the last nine months, let me put it into perspective, in the last nine months, six young people within Birmingham have lost their lives to knife crime. Six people. You heard about the six fatalities, but many of you guys didn't hear about the six funerals. But then we asked ourselves that fundamental question, is it not our problem? So let me show you the image. Because sometimes when we look at images, the, Im the images bring into perspective of the reality that we're dealing with right now. Young people, none of them made it to the age of 19. But then we look at issues within our community. Trivial arguments, trivial beef, trivial disputes. I need you to look at that image because that image represents our children. That image represents our future, our future generations. Look at the images. I've had the opportunity to work with families that have been impacted by some of these murders. And when you look at the state of their families and we'll look at secondary victimization in sessions to come, but when you look at the impact and you reflect on the impact that that has on families and communities, you can understand why communities become disorganized. You can understand why there's disunity, why there's lack of trust in our communities. Look at the image. Joshua was the last individual in our community to lose his life. In that same week, as in lost his life also in that same week. Two deaths in one week. A year before that, when Joshua died, his friend, close friend Kyle, died. Both knife-related incidents. We've heard of Christina, died on the bus. Ben Motore at a party. Boys roll up to the party, take his life. And again, when we look at the impact of what that has done to their families, it's catastrophic. So we always hear about the fatalities, but we never look at the impact of those fatalities and what that has on us and members of us within the community. So who do you think that image represents at the end? The next one. And this individual that's there in the corner, look at it close. That individual in the corner can be my son, can be your son, your brother, your sister. So if we're living in a community when we have a context and we understand what's going on within our community, we have to take into consideration what is taking place. Why? Because this could happen to one of our children, unfortunately. Many of you guys ask that question, why? Many of you guys ask that question, why? Why? Why do young people within our communities... Why are they violent? Why do they become violent? Those that are studying criminology, psychology, sociology, or just want to have an understanding of what is going on within our communities. I thought that it's interesting that I'll, I'll put out some, just a little bit of theory just to kind of put things out there. This is taken from Dr. Martin Glynn, his book around black men, invisibility and crime. 
So his research, I'm utilising a lot of his research to give you a contextual understanding about what is taking place. So in the research, and this covers a lot of the research that we look at, when we're looking at why young people involve themselves in criminality or crime, specifically within our community, what always comes at the top is the impact of father absence, father deficit, the fact that father is at home, the fact that there's not a positive male within the household or positive males within the family structure. And the psychological impact of that affects young men and young women slightly different. And we'll talk about that slightly later when we look at father absence. But that always comes up at the top when we're looking at the research. Poor self-concept always comes up. When you look at reports, a report that's important to look at is a report called Dying to Belong. 2009 was written by the... Um, Criminal um, Justice Service, they, they wrote a report called Dying to Belong, and there's another one called Time to Change. Both of them, two journals that I think is very important that I think most of you guys should note down and look at. Poor self concept comes in. The fact that young people within our community don't know themselves, don't know who they are, develop self hatred upon themselves. So you can understand the reason why they may look at other people that look like them that might live in another postcode. None of them own the postcodes in which they live. But they hate the people that live five minutes, ten minutes away from them. You can start to understand that. Number three, code of the streets. Why is code of the streets? Code of the streets is, a, is an unseen law, unseen philosophy that young people or members of the community hold, which enables them to deviate through this madness that what we see, being on road, survival on the streets. Being able to understand where you can go, where you can't go, understanding who the right people are to connect with, who those right, who those people that you shouldn't connect with. That code is unseen, and for those that don't live in the community or work in the community, need to have an understanding of what that code is. Because young people that are in our society that need help, need support, need guidance, need workers that understand their social reality and understand what's going on with them. So code of the streets, we understand that. The effects of incarceration, we've discussed this before. The fact that young people are in and out of the criminal justice system. And we know that the prison system isn't working. And we're looking at rehabilitation. It's not working. But we've got young people that are coming back out. Within two, three months, they're reoffending right back within the prison institutions. Community disconnect. We spoke about the disconnection within our communities between young people, elders, the criminal justice system, community as a whole. When you're looking at deaths within police custody, when you're looking at stops and search, we see the effects of the criminal justice system that it has on our communities. Silences. We'll speak about that slightly later, about the impact of silences that young people or members of the community have a difficulty expressing, articulating what they feel. And when one can't articulate their issue, sometimes it turns to rage, it turns to anger, it turns to frustration. People lash out. Some people, some people turn to drugs, some people turn to alcohol, some people commit suicide. A racialized social structure. We don't often look at racism and the impact that it has on communities. The disproportionate numbers within a criminal justice system. The overrepresentation of young black males within society, in the media. We don't ever look at racism and its adverse impact that it has on society as a whole and certain sections of the community. So when we look at reasons of why young people engage in certain types of violence, it's important that we understand that. So what is the reality of our youth? We're always talking about the social reality of our young people. So let me break it down what the reality is. And this is taken from what young people here say themselves. So when you speak to young people in the community and say, Yo, what is your social reality? What are you going through right now on the day to day? They'll say that, you know what, fam, I feel trapped. I live within this postcode, this is all I know. We confined it to B6, B19, B20, B21. This is all I know, this is all I understand. Some people are bored. I'll just give you a context that 18 youth provisions have been closed within the city since 2012. So it won't be a coincidence that in those areas where the youth provisions have been closed, if you have bored young people that start to engage in criminal activity, 2011 in the riots in August demonstrated what boredom does to young people. Some people are involved in violence or criminal activity due to family. Intergenerational. My granddad was involved. My dad was involved. I'm involved. For some young people, education is long. 
We hear them say that all the time. You know, education is long. Most of them want to make money right now. Some young people don't know what they want to be. Some people have no clue about their future. Many of us in the room right now, if I was to ask you, what do you want to be in your future right now? What is your future goal and career? Most of you in the room will say that you don't know what you want to do. Most of our young people don't either. The road life has benefits. We know that. In terms of the reality of the young people on a day to day, they know the road life has benefits. Why? For boys, you can get all the gal, money, you can get anything. Dance is free. You get respect sometimes by default. For girls, again, status. And all the same things that likewise our boys experience, road life has benefits. Many young people in our community have unsettled beef. So some young people want to do good, they want to change, they want to do different, but many of them have unsettled beef. Beef going back five years, ten years, that might be related to a brother, a cousin, a sister. To some young people, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. They're told they're stupid, they're told they're going to go to prison, they're told they're going to amount to anything. Some people, Believe that some young people adopt the label of deviant, criminal, gang member, and then they amplify it. Some young people just don't want to be disrespected. We hear that all the time. We hear most arguments and trivial beefs, and most of those life crime um, incidents that I've just spoke about earlier, most of them go down to that. Some of them just don't want to be disrespected, whether it's to do with a girl, whether it's to do with someone um, didn't give you the money on time. Any trivial argument, we find that disrespect comes up as a main thing. Many young people want to leave a legacy. We've heard of incidents that have taken place within our community where individuals have been sent to prison for a very long time. Some young people, unfortunately in our community, are inspired by those types of individuals and want to live that same type of lifestyle. I want to leave that legacy for individuals that will come up and the list goes on. Find a slide before I let you guys go away quickly. One of the things that I kind of picked up and I thought was important, again comes from Dr. Glynn's work, is looking at the youth of today versus traditional values. And when we look traditionally about families and the youth of today, it's quite interesting that when we look historically about family, there was always that extended social structure, there was always that extended family, individuals that you was all connected to, regular, within the week, within the month, there was always people that you would connect to. When you look at the youth today, they're dis disconnected to their families. We've looked at the impact of fathers, parents, mothers outside of the household. The fact that mum has to work two, three jobs and don't really have that much of a relationship with their children. We look at community history. Traditionally, you would always have a community that would have a strong sense of history, strong sense of culture. You speak to young people today in 2014, that's absent. They have no knowledge of their history. They don't have no knowledge of who they are or what their culture is. Present elders. Historically, traditionally, elders was always pre present within our community. We look at young people now, we talk to young people about elders, that likewise is absent. Even to the point where I'll catch a bus, go into one area, and I'll see young people supposed to be waiting in a line behind old people. But we'll push in front of old people just to get on the bus. So the respect between youth and the elderly is gone. When I was growing up, it was imperative that if I seen an old person struggling with bags, Struggling up the road, it was imperative that I would walk over and I'd ask, do you need help? Do you need support? I'd always say good morning, but we speak to young people nowadays, that's absent.